father died. I was living in a group home in Carson, California. And after school, I went over to one of my homies' houses. And we was just over there chilling, like, watching what used to be a thing. <laughs> it's not a thing any longer. But it used to be a thing after school cartoons. There was only a certain time and certain channels <laughs> that you could watch after school. And they would have cartoons. And during a commercial break, you know, flashed on the news, uh uh, you know, breaking news coming up at three or four, you know, whenever the hell it was. Um, you know, Bay singer. The Temptations, Melvin Franklin, has passed away at the age of 52. And it was almost surreal because, and mind you, I haven't, I hadn't seen my father, but maybe a handful of times over the course of my life, but it was really surreal because I had not, I had never considered the fact that my father could die without me having the opportunity to unite with him. I grew up in group homes. Like I've, I've been, um, I've been in institution, you know, since, as I say, knee high to a grasshopper. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I was pretty much born a product of the system. And deep down, I kind of held out hope that, you know, one day there would be some sort of reconciliation moment between my father and I where, you know, he would come to himself and, and realize that, you know, I, I have this son that's wasting away in, in, in group homes and, you know, let me step up to the plate and be a father. And maybe, who knows, one day, that would have or could have occurred. But when I saw that breaking news during the commercial break, like it, there, there was this surreal feeling that, dis that descended upon me where it was almost in like a dreamlike state. Like this, this, this can't be real, this can't be happening. Um, it's like my last vestige of hope that I, I hadn't even realized I had until that moment. I didn't know that I was keeping hope alive deep down until that happened. And I saw that and I was shook. And my buddy, whose house I was over, he knew who my father was. We were that close. So that was an information that I shared with a lot of people simply because of the situation and the circumstance that I was in. You know, I'm in a group home and I'm talking how, you know, I'm talking about my father is this world famous musician who's touring around the globe, who you see on television. And, you know, they're looking at me like, well, what the fuck are you doing here? You know, so very early on, I, I kind of learned to keep that information to myself. There has there have been a few times where people found out on their own, and um, you know, m mainly adults. And when I was a child, mainly adults, and you know, they would start to treat me uh, a bit preferentially, I would say. And you know, that would piss the other kids off and stuff. So again, I I, I just tried to keep that information to myself, right? But this particular friend. He knew about it as well as the group home that I was residing in. All the staff and the kids there knew about it. Um, and that was, that's a whole nother story. My, the day I went into that group home, my social worker felt the need to announce to everybody that I was the son of Melvin Franklin and all this whole stupid shit. Right. So anyway, so everybody in the group home knew my buddy knew because I told him. So he looks at me. Once we see this commercial, and it, was, it wasn't a commercial, right? Breaking news during the commercial break. And like he looks at me, and I look at him. 
And I just get up and walk out the house and say a word. Uh, as soon as I get out the house, I start sprinting. And I sprinted all the way back to the group home I was living in. And this is, you know, this was probably a good, you know, maybe half mile away. But, um, you know, I couldn't tell. It, it seemed as though I was there in an instant. Um, you know, that, that space and time was literally a blur. I just remember beginning to sprint. And then next thing I know, I'm at the front door of the group home. And it's Miss Green's group home. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Green, crazy ass. When I get to the door, I open the door, and I shit you not, this has never, ever happened before. I get to the door, and the door faces in. When, 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 you, open, when you walk through the front door, you immediately step into the foyer, and right in front of the foyer is, is the living room, and the television's in the living room, right? Now, <clears throat> more often than not, there may be one staff member, maybe one of the kids, because it was six of us in that house, maybe one of the kids in the living room. But more often than not, we were in the back room, which you had to go through the kitchen on the left and then pass through the kitchen through the sliding glass door into the back room, which we had considered kind of a playroom type area. And that's where all the games were set up. That's where the video games and the board games and all that stuff was set up. So more often than not, you could find everybody in the back room. But on this particular day, of all days, I walk in and literally everybody is in the living room. And not only is everybody in the living room, kids and staff, they're all glued to the television. I swear you could not script this shit any better. They're all in front of the television. And that breaking news clip is playing again at that very moment as I walk through the door. And they're looking at the TV. I walk through the door. They turn and look at me. Then they turn and look back at the TV. Then they turn back and look at me. And I'm just standing there. Like, wow. Wow. I don't even know what to say. Everybody sees that I'm fucked up. I just go in my room. My roommate comes in maybe, maybe 10 minutes later. Oh, hey man, you all right? Like, I, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know how to feel. Because I'm still processing. If I, like I hadn't realized at that point in time that what I was feeling was lost hope. I just knew I was feeling something that I had never felt before. And I was still trying to process what that was. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good or not. He's like, look, don't trip. I got something for you. So he leaves. And his brother, uh, shout out to them, dude, Dennis and Eric. Um, I haven't seen y'all since I left that group home. But, um, you know, shout out to them, man. They, 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 they really stepped up that day, you know, to console me during that time. Um, in their own manner, but understand like all of these kids, I'm the only, I'm the only one in the house that doesn't gangbang, right? Everybody in that house at that particular time, uh, everybody was either from East coast crip or Grave street watch, you know, cause I, I did my own thing. You know, I, I didn't really deal with them too much except, you know, inside the house daily activities or whatnot, but outside the house, you know, they do their own thing. They, you know, they, these are hood cats. I'm, I'm, I wasn't no hood cat like that back then. But on this particular day, Eric, he was my roommate, uh, goes and gets his brother, Dennis, which was another amazing thing because rarely did you see siblings in the same group home. So that was dope. That's why I say shout out to Mrs. Green. But they went off and they would soon come back. But before they came back, I got a phone call. And this is what really fucked me up because, first of all, I had never received a phone call <laughs> at that group home. Like, nobody ever called asking for me, right? And I got a phone call 
staff comes and knocks at the door, there's someone on the phone for you. This is like maybe a couple of hours after I saw the, the news clip. And I go to the phone. I pick up the phone, hello. It's like, yo, cuzzo, I just heard what happened, man. Give me your address. I'm going to be there tomorrow to come get you. None other than Mr. DRJ, David Ruffin Jr., tracked me down within hours, found me, called me, and let me know I will be there tomorrow to come get you. Now, first of all, understand that this is before the Internet. This is before social media. You know, Google did not exist as a company or a concept. You had to track people down the old-fashioned way. And my own family hadn't even bothered to put forth that type of effort. And when I say my own family, I mean my immediate family. You know, mother, father, um, you know, uncles, aunts, grandmother, uh, the people that I was familiar with as a child before entering into institution. None of them could have been bothered to know where I was. I was completely and utterly alone. I didn't go on home passes. Um, I didn't have visitors. Like, for all intents and purposes, I was an island. And so imagine my shock and awe that my cousin tracks me down and without a thought, like, yo, I'll be there tomorrow. I'm like, bet. Now, this is back when he was still... I, I think he was still fucking with death row real heavy at this time. So I'm like, bet, you know, mine's kind of blown. Like, wow, somebody, somebody actually cares, which means the world to a child, um, to any child, but especially one, you know, who, who feels as though they're all by themselves in this world, right? So, so while I'm processing that, Eric and Dennis come back. They're like, yo, come outside with us. I'm like, bet. We go outside, we go across the street. We stayed right across the street from Curtis Middle School, right there in that corner house on Sultan Circle. <laughs> I'll never forget that shit. And we go across the street to uh, to the school. And it's it's after dark now. Um, or like, probably like right around dusk at this point in time and we go over to the school and there's like this little shed that they took me to that's which I found out was their little kick it spot um but there was like this tool shed over on the school property that was never used and these motherfuckers didn't put like couches and shit in there and <laughs> had a little you know they had a little radio and and everything, was, you know, bottles and cans and shit, you know. I was like, wow, okay, this where you, this where y'all be disappearing to, right? They sat down, they sat me down. I was like, look, man, you know what you're dealing with. First time, you know, they opened up to me a little bit about their lives. And um, they rolled up a joint. And they lit the joint and they passed me the joint. They was like, look, yo, hit this. Now, I didn't know what it was. I never smoked before. I'd never seen weed. Like I never, I had no idea. Like I, I was completely <laughs> green, <laughs> pardon the pun. <laughs> and um, and they passed me the joint, you know, and I hit that joint and I swear to you, it seemed as though, <laughs> now I just, I just, I'm sorry. I did because literally just right now, cloud nine was playing in my head. <laughs> I'm feeling fine. <laughs> it's like, yo. Um, I hit that shit, yo. And when I tell you, I have never, to this very day, I have never laughed harder in my entire life prior to or since then. On the day my father died, I was all alone in this world. And I had believed that my last ray of hope just disappeared. And God saw fit <laughs> to 
send people to me that had never really dealt with me before and bring a smile to my spirit. I will always, always, always forever be indebted to Eric and Dennis for that day. Not necessarily for introducing me to weed. <laughs> you know, but for taking the time to deal with a square, with a civilian, you know, and, 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 and pouring into me. That shit meant the world, you know. Um, like, r- real niggas have hearts, yo. Like, don't don't get it twisted. Like, some of the most caring most honorable men that I know are gangsters. You know what I'm saying? Like some of the most stand-up dudes I've ever met in my life will slit your fucking throat. But these dudes are great, great men. Men of character, men of family, men of honor. And that was my first glimpse into that the day my father died. So now, next day, Mr. DRJ pulls up on me, scoops me up, takes me back to his spot. He was in the valley. He was living in the valley at that time. Um, I don't remember exactly where. Again, I was super young. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly where, but um, was he a Reseda? I don't remember. Anyways, I'll ask him. He takes me to his crib. Now, mind you, I just started smoking weed yesterday. (laughs) Right. First joint ever hit in my life was the day prior. Once we get to his crib, the very first thing he does is break out a bong and this big ass pack of weed. (laughs) And he stuffs the ball. He's like, here. And I'm looking at him like, what in the hell am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> He's like, you ain't never hit a bomb before? I'm like, no. <laughs> what the hell is a bong? He's like, yeah, here, let me show you. And he, you know, he, he fired it up, hit the bong and everything. And as I'm watching that shit, I'm like, hell no. That is way too much smoke. Like, are you kidding? You try to kill me. <laughs> and uh, he's like, no, no, no. You know, just just do a little bit. Like, it, it's, it's cool. And man, I hit that damn bong, yo. I, I t- yo, I hit that bong. I t- okay, so the day before, I have never laughed harder before or since. Okay, so the day after, that day, there in David's apartment, I have never coughed harder before or since. When I tell you I coughed so hard, my nuts started hurting. Like, it, 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 that, I was, nope, that was, so, that was my introduction to the bong. <laughs> and, um, so I was cool on that. I was like, yo, can I roll some joints or something? Right. And of course I didn't know how to roll. So <laughs> So um I'm trying to roll my little struggle joint. And uh he sees I have no clue what I'm doing. So he helps me out, shows me how to roll, like for sure. Of course, my joints were still shit, but I was able to manage to get it on my own. And I stayed with him all the way up into the funeral. Now, mind you, I had never been in a in 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 I had never been on a home pass. I I had again I had never had any visit visitor like I my whole life was school and the group home, and so which is why I tried so hard to stay at school so long. Like I involved myself in every possible extracurricular activity that I could, just to stay the fuck out the house. So this was foreign to me having been out of the group home for so long. Like I stayed, I stayed with David. I think the funeral was like the following week. I stayed with, I stayed with David for like seven or eight days, something like that, but all the way up into the funeral and yo, the funeral, man. Okay. Look, so anyway, I'm with David and let me, let me backtrack. So I'm staying with David and 
he's uh, I think upstairs upstairs was his engineer and that was my first like real exposure to like some major studio equipment like you know they had the big ass SSL board and everything and I was just like yo I like the guy had never been exposed to this shit before and um you know I got to watch I got to watch him work a little bit and I was like yeah man you know I I get down a little bit myself you know he's like where of course you know I was I was trash back then like I, <laughs> I was I was terrible but I was determined and uh you know, I spit some shit for him and everything. It's like, okay, that's what's up. That's cool. And you could tell, like, you know, he was just kind of placating me and stuff, you know. But at least he didn't tell me to my face I was trash. So good looking out, cuz. <laughs> <laughs> and that gave me the confidence to keep getting better. So I would watch him work and everything. And I learned a lot just about, first of all, about the free world. Because I didn't realize that I had been kind of in, in like a state of incarceration without actually being incarcerated, but my my entire life was school and the group home. Like, so it's just, it's all institution. It's institution at school, it's institution at home, right? And so uh, experiencing this type of freedom was, was a brand new concept to me. And uh, what happened? Oh, that's, that's why people, oh, you talking about recidivism? Right. Right. It's all that's right. Exactly. Right. It becomes your normal. Mm -hmm. So anything that's not your normal becomes uncomfortable. It's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Right. So it absolutely. You're absolutely correct. So this concept of freedom was new to me. Like just being able to go to the store when I wanted to. Like that. Like just simple shit like that. Like it was. It. It, it was amazing. Um. Like we could go to the park and go play basketball. Or you, like just little shit. You know. And and. And not have to worry about niggas tripping, and you, you know, cause you at the wrong park, like you don't belong up here, <laughs> you know that type of shit. Like it, it was, it was really, really refreshing. And so I got to, strangely, in what should have been a time of mourning. For me, it was more like a a a, a, a time of rebirth. It's, it's, it's great because again, like everybody's, everybody's fucked up obviously. Cause you know, my dad just passed, but I'm sitting here experiencing life in a completely brand new way that I never imagined prior to this. And it was all predicated upon my father passing. What'd you say? Sounds like hope. Sounds like hope. Exactly. <laughs> so while I had thought, right, that I was losing hope God was seeing to it to ensure that I did not lose it because he had a plan for me little did I know <laughs> little did I know but then so we get to the funeral and boy when I tell you <laughs> the stars were out and I'm sitting here again I'm just a few like just last week yo I'm I'm, I'm sitting in this group home you, you hating my life, like uh, not uh, understand like why wasn't I aborted and all, like it, it's there's it some crazy, crazy, crazy thoughts used to go through my head, and now I'm sitting here right behind Michael fucking Jackson. You know what I'm saying? Like literally, like right behind him, and this is all, I'm sitting here like I'm looking around at everybody, like I'm tripping out like. Like, y'all can't see this shit? Like, <laughs> don't y'all see that Michael fucking Jackson is sitting right here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, um, and uh, yeah, that, it, it just blew my mind, yo. But, uh, you know, they got up there and sung and did their thing. What well, was so cold, I didn't even get a chance to approach the casket. Like, so I didn't get a chance to see him or nothing like that. Like, it was almost as though I was there as like an honorary family member. Now that looking back on it, because again, I was so young, I couldn't process any of this stuff. But as they say, hindsight is twenty twenty, And in retrospect, I was kind of just there because I had to be like, it would have been foul of them not to bring me. But I was, 
again, I was an afterthought. I was the only child in the family that was not associated with the family. Again, like I, I was tucked away safely in a group home. Like there's a whole slew of people that didn't even know I existed. Now, whether or not that was done purposely, we'll never know. But I, I wasn't even introduced to anyone as Melvin's son. Like I, again, I was just there. So, anyways, after the funeral, um, we go back to David's crib, and then you know David takes me back to the group home. And it was then and there that I decided, you know, soon I got back and, 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 you know, it's pretty much like normal routine, right? Resume normal program. It was at that point that I decided like, yo, I, I, I can't continue to do this. Um, I don't want to be in it. I don't want to be in here anymore. You know, after once I tasted what freedom was, you know, I tried my best to plot and scheme on how I could escape the institution. And, um, the rest is history. Hmm. Yeah, that was the day my dad died. God poured hope into me when I thought all hope was lost. And I think that's that's the lesson that I take out of that. <laughs>